Hey guys, this video is a continuation of my series on coding a bot to play the Teamfight Tactics video game. In this video, I'm going to show you how to code the portion which extracts the useful information out of the game so that the AI can make decisions. To start with, I've taken a whole bunch of screenshots of myself playing the game so that I can use it for testing while I'm coding so that I don't have to actually play the game while I'm coding. So here's the main screen that's most important. And you'll notice a bunch of elements that are useful to the player. So for example, at the bottom are the units that I can select for purchase. So I need the AI to be able to extract this information out of the screen as I'm playing. There are two ways I might consider doing this. One is to analyze the actual graphics. So for example, each character has a different portrait. To the computer, reading the names is significantly easier. So that's the option I wanna to approach today. And then in a separate video, the things that cannot be extracted with text. I'll instead use the image analysis libraries to try to extract out from the 3D models and pictures instead. So to start out our project, first I'm gonna open the Visual Studio Code program and I'm gonna open up the terminal and I'm going to change my directory to a folder I set up for this project. You can see that other than my screenshots, there's nothing in here. When I run that npm init command, it will generate some files for me. So first it's gonna ask me some questions. After that npm init command is finished, it creates this file called package.json. You may want to just double check that your node is set up correctly. So for example, I could type node-v, that'll give me my version number, uh, which I just recently updated, so I know that's the latest. But you can do the same for the npm command. Um, so that's my version of npm. You may want to update both of these, node from the node website. npm you can update using the npm install command. Dash G means global. So this package JSON file will remember which packages you've installed. But if you do dash G for global, instead of my local package.json, there's a global one that's shared for all of your projects. So you would use this for packages that you use frequently. So this is a little bit weird, but NPM is used to install packages, but I can also use it to update itself. So I'll say NPM and then the at sign with the version number. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do, I mentioned that I'm gonna use TypeScript instead of JavaScript. So I'm gonna say npm install TypeScript. You'll notice in my package JSON, it automatically added a dependencies key and the first dependency is TypeScript and it automatically determined the version number. So now that we have TypeScript installed, we need to set up our TypeScript. So I can do that with the npx command. That also comes from npm, but the X just stands for execute. So I can run these dependencies as if they were executable programs. So TSC comes from the TypeScript dependency and it stands for TypeScript's compiler. And these type of commands that I'm showing to you, they're pretty common, you'll use them a lot. So you can just kind of memorize them over time if you code frequently. But if not, if you just Googled, for example, how to code a hello world program in TypeScript, they're going to kind of explain these steps to you. Within the TypeScript compile command, since this is the first time I'm going to set up my program, I'm going to use the dash dash in it. So that has created for me a file called tsconfig. So if I click to show all the files, you can see I have the package JSON, which npm init created, and now I have tsconfig JSON, which the npx tsc init command created. And then the package dash lock dot JSON, that is from the npm install command. So let's take a look at this tsconfig file. And it's just a whole bunch of different settings for how TypeScript is going to compile. So TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, meaning that all of the existing JavaScript code works, but you can use additional commands that are not built into JavaScript and it all compiles down to JavaScript. So it just, adds new features to the JavaScript language. Most of these settings I can just kind of leave at the default, but there are two settings I need to change to make my projects easier to code. So I uncommented them and I'm gonna change them from true to false. No implicit any and strict null checks. These are extra rules that the compiler will run to check for warnings in your code. But most of the time, warnings are not actually pointing out a real bug in the code. I don't need the compiler to refuse to run my code just because it thinks there might be an issue. So now TypeScript is set up so that we can run. Let me just create the last file I need, which is index.ts. So that's going to be where our actual code resides. 
So just to make sure our TypeScript is working, I'm just gonna do like a console.log statement. Is TypeScript working? Question mark. I'll open up the terminal and I'll say npx ts dash node period backslash index dot ts. ts dash node stands for TypeScript node. So this is just going to compile and run my TypeScript file. If I hit enter, it runs my code and it says it's TypeScript working. And you'll notice that it opened up this run window. It will actually attach a debugger. So if I put a breakpoint in here by clicking on the left side here, and then I run it again, you'll see that it stopped at my breakpoint. So it, it has not actually printed on the screen yet, is TypeScript working? Because this console log has not run. And here inside the debugger, I can choose to step through the code one line at a time. And on the left side, I can see all of the variables that are in memory in my program right now. So if I was trying to figure out if my code was working or not, I might want to look and inspect these variables to see if they have the values that I expect them to have. So I'll just continue so that the code finishes running. So the next step in our project is going to be to set up the Tesseract API inside of TypeScript. I can do that with another npm install command for node-tesseract-ocr. And you'll see in the package JSON that it created the dependency on it. But if I copy this and pull it up on the npm JS website, then I can read information about how this project works. So it has, for example, the install command, some code for analyzing an image, and it also has a GitHub link where I could go to read additional help, see the source code, and in the issues tab, I could file bugs. And in the pull request, I could submit my own code that improves on the Tesseract library. But something important to know about this particular NPM library is Tesseract itself is the code for recognizing the text in an image. The OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition. But this particular library is just a node wrapper. It does not actually contain the code for Tesseract itself. It expects you to install Tesseract separately, and this will just call the Tesseract executable. So if you wanted to install Tesseract, you would open up separate GitHub for the main Tesseract library, and it has an installer. I'm on Windows, so this is the installer I would run. And if you wanna check whether or not Tesseract is installed on your computer, you can open up a command prompt and type the word Tesseract. And in my case, it shows the help options for how to execute the Tesseract command. For example, typically you pass in an image file name. If yours just says error Tesseract command not recognized, then you don't have Tesseract installed and you'll need to download the installer from this GitHub page. So now that we've verified Tesseract is installed on our computer, we can go back to the example code that we are given and use that as a template to start our program. So first I'm going to import Tesseract into my project. This is different from the npm install command. The npm install downloads the files into a folder called node modules. So if I open up this node modules and look at node Tesseract OCR, I can see a bunch of files that were downloaded by npm. This import command is going to look at this index.js file and include that code inside of my index.ts file so that all the Tesseract code stays in its own file, but I can reference any APIs that are exposed by the Tesseract.js um, code. So next I want to just do a console log statement on the results of executing Tesseract. Tesseract has a recognize function, which will scan an image for text. And you'll notice that VS Code is able to show all of the parameters that the recognize function needs. Part of that is because we're using TypeScript, and so functions in TypeScript are well-defined with specific parameters and data types. So that gives me an, a hint on what type of parameters I should pass in, which is really helpful. So I'm gonna pass in one of these screenshots, and I'll open the image so that we can see what we expect it to be able to read. So we want it to read words like nar, gadgetine, prankster, etc. There's words all over the screen. So I'm going to declare a config variable where I'll pass in the settings for Tesseract. I have the file name and I have to use double backslashes because JavaScript has escape characters in strings for special characters that can't be represented easily. So for example, slash R is a carriage return. Like if you press the enter key, you can't really do an enter key inside of JavaScript because now the string is on two separate lines and that's gonna confuse 
the JavaScript interpreter. So by using the slash R, I can put an enter key inside of a string. But because backslash is the prefix for doing a special character, then you can't do a single backslash by itself. So instead I have to do two backslashes. And so it will essentially turn into a single backslash when the interpreter removes the prefix or the escape character. So the config settings I'm gonna pass in, I just copied from that example on the NPM website, but I'm gonna use language of English. OEM stands for OCR engine mode. So it's kind of like which version of Tesseract I'm using. So number one just means the newest engine. PSM stands for page segmentation mode. And I'm gonna start with number one, which is automatic. And let me give you an example of what page segmentation mode means. If I pull up a form like this, you'll notice that it uses red borders everywhere. This is actually designed so that it can be scanned by a computer, each box having a specific purpose. And the page segmentation mode that I chose earlier of automatic, it's designed for this type of format. And the last parameter I need to send in is the list of characters that I'm allowing it to search for. So for example, if I know that I'm only gonna have numbers, then I can do this and it'll never give me any alphabet characters. And I think I'll actually just leave this parameter off for now to just allow it to search for any characters. Now this await command, if you press F12, it will take you to the definition of this function. So the parameters that it wants as input and the value that it returns. But you'll notice that the return type is a promise and inside of the promise is a string. A promise is used for asynchronous coding. And what that means is anything that does not return a result instantly. So an example would be if I just say, let math equals one plus one, the computer knows the answer to this instantly. So it doesn't need to wait on anything. So that's called synchronous. But if instead I said something like let download equals HTTP client, google.com question mark, you know, JavaScript. So that's just pseudocode, but Google's not instant. It's got to send a message to my internet company. It's going to take multiple hops through the network to get to Google. And then Google's got to search its database. Then it's got to convert it to HTML and then it's got to send it back to me. And the internet was not designed to send large amounts of information at a time. Instead, it sends little packets and you have to wait for all of the packets to arrive. And then your computer combines all the packets together to get the final result. So this command is not instant. And when we talk about instant with regard to a computer, you got to think about your CPU. The typical CPU today is going to have a clock speed of like four gigahertz, meaning it can do a trillion calculations in a single second. Well, Calculating one plus one can probably be done in one single cycle. A more complicated programming command might take five or 10 cycles, but that's still extremely fast. That's happening in nanoseconds. Downloading from Google might take half a second. Well, that's an eternity for a computer. So this code that's gonna download from Google needs to be asynchronous so that the CPU can keep doing other things while it's waiting for this internet response to come back. So because recognize is a promise variable, a promise means that it will notify you when the result is available so that your code can keep on running. So there's two ways that I can do this. So I am using an asynchronous wait. So it's going to yield and allow other programs to run until the result is available. And then when the notification comes in that it's ready, it'll continue to execute the next line of code. So for example, if I do a console.log here and type like done with the recognized command, this log will not run until recognize is finished. So that allows me to still code it as if it was synchronous while still not locking up the CPU. An alternative to that would be if I said, take the result of executing this function and put it into a variable. Then here, if I did a console.log, I would actually just say, recognize started because it actually has not finished yet. And I could do a promise dot then command. I pass it a parameter and that parameter is another function. And that function is a callback. I do an additional console log inside here saying it's done. This is where the final result 
is available. So it's a little bit weird because as a human, you expect to read things one line at a time sequentially. But in this case, it's kind of jumping around because it'll run this first, then run the outer piece here, then run this line, then it'll jump back and run the inner piece. And this inner piece might run five seconds later, depending on how long the recognize took. So promises are the base data type in JavaScript for doing asynchronous code, but it's a little confusing that things run out of order. So that's the benefit of the await command is you can write your code as if it was sequential and behind the scenes, the compiler will rewrite it to be these promises. So I'm going to use the await command instead, and I'll just log the result that came from running recognize. So one issue here is that the await command cannot be used in the top level of a node program. It has to be inside of a function. So I just need to wrap this whole thing in a function. So I'll just say function test and then outside of this test function, I'll just execute it. And then I'll paste my code inside of the test. And then if you're going to use the await command inside of a function, you have to declare the function as asynchronous. So I'll just put async at the front. Okay, so let's run this code right here and see what happens. Okay, it looks like it ran and it output everything that it was able to read off of the image. So let's just see how it did. So the first thing kind of looks like gibberish, but it's I-V-I-L-E-P-B-E. -E. That's the first line that it found. And then it found a whole bunch of other lines. So let's see if we can find this word in the image. I'm gonna zoom in. Okay, I think what it was reading here was this player's name on the right side. And it seems like for the most part, it read that word correctly. The only thing I would say it read wrong is to me, the V looks like it's capitalized, but Tesseract shows it as a lowercase. Okay, so the next thing it read is backslash V space level space five exclamation. I think it got that from this level five exclamation directly underneath that player's name. And so the level five exclamation is correct. However, this backslash V space, that does not match at all. But you'll notice in the picture, there's like this weird arrow icon. Because that arrow has kind of a well-defined shape, then I think it's analyzing that and thinking it's a letter. And because there's not a letter in the alphabet that perfectly matches that shape, it's just giving its best guess. So that's one issue that we're gonna have to deal with is how to not have it get confused by these random graphics. Because if that icon can confuse it, then could these pictures of weapons confuse it? So I'm not gonna look at every little thing it read, but it seems like it's getting some of it correct and some of it wrong. So let's think about how we can fix this. I chose to make this the page segmentation mode of automatic, which I mentioned was designed to scan a document like this with a specific template, but TFT isn't exactly like this and probably a lot of the random graphics are confusing it. So what if instead we took our image and we cropped to just a specific part that we wanted to read? Could it then read it correctly? So for example, here we have Nar, Lucian, Alistar, Jax, and Ash. Let's see if any of those were read correctly. As I scroll through the results, I notice almost all of them are here at the bottom, Nar, Lucian, Alistar, and Jax, but Ash is missing. So if I crop just the word Ash and I make a brand new image and I paste the portion I cropped and save it, cropped.png. Now something to keep in mind here, when I save, I wanna use PNG instead of JPG because a JPEG file is compressed. And that matters because a library like Tesseract, it's using mathematics to try to analyze the image and anything that modifies the image may reduce the quality of the results that Tesseract gives us. So we wanna keep it the same as how the original game rendered it. And then if we get poor results, we wanna be very careful about which algorithms we run to try to improve our results. We don't wanna just accidentally modify the image without being purposeful because we care more about accuracy than we do file size in the situation. And in addition to that, you'll notice that on my screenshots, they're all 1920 by 1080. Whatever your monitor screen resolution is, you wanna make sure that you take that screenshot from the game in that native resolution and don't resize it. And again, I've saved as PNG because later on when we start analyzing 
3D models or icons for weapons, that same concept is going to apply. So we want to make sure we don't distort the image in any way before we analyze it. Okay, now we've got this cropped image. Let's rerun our recognize code and see if it's able to find that word because when it was trying to find it in the overall large image, it was not able to. Okay, right here we see it got the word ash. So the first thing we've learned is we don't necessarily want to trust this automatic page segmentation mode in our specific example of scraping a game. So we're gonna need to crop everything on our own based on the location where we expect to find the right text. So for example, I need to pull up this image in a paint program and get the coordinates for the UI elements I care about reading and make a list of all of them. And I need to loop through that list and crop the image multiple times. And on each cropped image, run Tesseract to just get that one word. And if I'm going to do that, instead of using page segmentation mode automatic, which is the number one, I'm gonna use seven instead, which is just looking for a single line of text. And then also in order to avoid some of the gibberish, for example, we had like this backslash V. If we know we're never gonna be looking for a backslash, then we wanna put in this dictionary to avoid it finding incorrect characters that we know are not accurate but we'll want a different dictionary for each part of the UI. For example, we know that the name won't necessarily have a number, but the gold won't have a letter. And some UI elements we don't necessarily care about. For example, we need to know that we have five gold, but we don't need to know that NAR costs three gold. And we don't need to know that NAR is a gadgetine and a prankster because we can hard code who the character NAR is and what his attributes are, because that's not gonna change from game to game. So we really just need to know that it's a NAR and that uniquely will tell us all of his attributes. So let's make some code changes. And just for informational purposes of how Tesseract works, I'm gonna pull up this image. So essentially when the computer looks at an image like this flower on the left, there are just too many colors and just too much noise. It's hard for it to know what this picture is. So the computer first runs some math through the image to modify it and it uses an edge detection algorithm. So that looks at large changes in contrast or color. So it converts it to this middle picture, which is just black and white. And it kind of shows the sharpness of the edges. And that kind of gets rid of a lot of the noise so that the computer can see the overall shape. And once the noise has been removed so that just the shape is obvious, Tesseract then runs it through something called a neural network. And a neural network is modeled after how scientists think our brains work with synapses that fire and send messages to each other. Well, if we want this to recognize that this is a flower, what we do is we train the network based on this input and we tell it what the output is that we expect. And the training goes in reverse and think of these middle layer nodes, their internal mathematical function can be changed. And so the output, instead of it just saying the word flower, maybe we want it to say a percentage likelihood that it is a flower. If you run this training process millions of times off of thousands of images, and maybe a hundred of those images are flowers and the others are just random images of anything except for a flower, then it can find a pattern where only the flowers come up with a high probability and everything else comes with a low probability. And it's never going to be perfect, but it can be close. And so Tesseract uses this concept, but instead of looking for flowers, it's looking for shapes in the alphabet. So it might train one to recognize a capital A, a different neural network to recognize the lowercase a, and it's gonna run each of these neural networks off of your image and then look at all the probabilities and it's gonna pick the highest probability and say, this is what letter we think this is. So that's how Tesseract works. So let's modify our code to be able to read the rest of this screenshot. So I'm gonna install two more NPM packages. NPM install at u4 slash opencv4 node.js. OpenCV stands for Open Computer Vision. And similar to Tesseract, it's a computer vision library, but instead of being specific to reading letters, 
it's more generic, can read a whole bunch of different things. And I'll go into more detail on that library in a future video. In this particular video, I'm just gonna use it for cropping images. And I'm also going to install at tensorflow slash tfjs dash node. TensorFlow is a machine learning library. And where I just explained how Tesseract works using a neural network, neural networks are one type of machine learning algorithm. So TensorFlow could be used to make a neural network and it could be used to make something like Tesseract. But machine learning requires a lot of complicated math. And so TensorFlow has some math formulas that we'll find useful. In particular, it has a lot of matrix functions. And so we're also gonna use it to help us with the cropping because when you think about it, an image really is just a matrix of colors. It's a two dimensional array of rows and columns of colors, which can be represented in a matrix. So in college, if you get into high end math, there's a subject called linear algebra, and that's basically all related to matrix math and matrices are really good for computer vision and graphics. So when we install that OpenCV library, unfortunately, most NPM libraries come with everything you need when you say NPM install. But just like with Tesseract, how we had to install it separately, OpenCV is that same way. So we're gonna need to go to opencv.org slash releases and download the Windows installer for the latest version. Otherwise, when we try to run any OpenCV code, it won't work. And I've already done that, but if you're following along, you'll need to do that. So let's write our code to crop an image. So I want a function called crop image, and I want to pass it an image as input, and I want the coordinates where it's going to be cropped. And then for the data types, I'm going to use a cv.mat uh, data type for the actual image itself, cv from the OpenCV library and mat meaning a matrix. And I'm getting a red error on CV because I have not imported the CV node module into my index.ts code. So I'll say import star as CV from at u4, and it looks like it'll autofill in for me. So the asterisk just means to import everything and put it all underneath a global variable called CV. So that way CV dot will give me access to everything inside of the CV library. If you know for sure that you only need specific functions, so for example, like just this mat, instead of doing star as CV, you could put in curly braces, just a comma separated list of which specific APIs inside of the node module you need. But I find it much easier, especially while you're still experimenting to just use the asterisk so that you get everything. The downside to that is you're gonna get a lot more code than you need imported into your program. So when it compiles, your executable is gonna be larger. And so when you give it to your users, they have to download more, the code's gonna run a little bit slower. However, that was more an issue in the past when JavaScript compilers were rudimentary. Now, when you compile, they use a technique called tree shaking. They try to analyze your code to find which functions are never used, it can remove them from the final compiled program and keep it small and fast. But the compilers are not perfect, mainly because JavaScript was not designed originally for these type of complex programs. And so JavaScript has features that prevent tree shaking from working very well. So if you're really wanting like perfectly fast performance and small load times, you should just pick individual APIs to import instead of everything. That's mostly important if you're building a web app because web apps need to be really fast. Okay, so my crop image function, it's going to take a computer vision matrix as input, it's gonna return a new computer vision matrix and I want the inputs to all be numbers. Uh, the computer vision library should have a crop function. And if I Google for it, it does exist. For some reason, this particular Node.js version does not have it. So that's why I'm also going to import the TensorFlow library is I'm gonna use it to do the actual cropping. Okay, so I'm gonna import TensorFlow and give it the prefix of TF and import TensorFlow TFJS node. So inside of my crop, I'm gonna make a variable for the result of cropping it. And I'm first going to convert to tensor 
from my cv.mat image. And this is a function that doesn't exist yet. I'm going to define it. So it takes a cv.mat and I want it to return atf.tensor. So a tensor is also a matrix. It's just a TensorFlow matrix instead of a computer vision matrix. And each of these types of matrices have their own APIs. So the TensorFlow one has a slice function, which you could think of as a crop. So I'm just gonna pass it the coordinates that I wanna slice and my image has now been cropped. And it probably feels odd that I'm putting Y comma X, but that's just because the way internally that TensorFlow stores its matrices is it does it by rows first and columns second. And so that's also why I did height before width. So now that my image has been cropped, I'm going to convert it back to a computer vision. So I'm gonna return tensor to CV on my cropped variable. And I also need to define that function. Bar tensor to CV equals function image of tensor with output of CV mat. Okay, but these functions are just stubbed, so I need to actually code them now. So I'm going to execute the tf.tensor function, which will create a new tensor for me, and I need to pass it my data. So CV has a get data function, which returns a buffer, which is kind of like an array. And then I need to define the format that this array is in so that tensor knows how to interpret it. So I'm gonna pass it the number of rows in my image and the number of columns that are in my image, and then also the number of values that are at each location in my matrix. So it's three because I have the colors red, green, and blue, and each of those is represented by a separate number. And most images also have an alpha channel, which is for transparency, but in my case, I'm choosing to ignore that. Okay, so that's how to convert in the one direction. Now let's convert the other way. So I can do that by calling the cv.mat constructor function. Anytime you call a constructor, you need the new keyword. And a constructor is a function inside of a class that sets up the initial variables of the class. So the tf.tensor function is almost identical in that it's setting up a tensor, but it was not defined by the API creators as a constructor. And so you don't need the new keyword, but internally, both of them are just kind of initializing the starting variables for that data type. So I'm going to pass it my height and my width and tensor isn't only for matrices, but it can be used for matrices. And so that's why instead of rows and columns like CV has, it uses a shape array and each index in that shape array will tell you the length of that specific axis. So in my case, since it's a two dimensional image or a matrix, I just have two axes, X and Y, or like rows and columns. So I just have shape zero and shape one. So that's basically just telling me the width and the height. Then I need to tell it what format the data for the image is in. So similar to how we told TensorFlow that we had three numbers to represent our colors, which TensorFlow just thinks of them as numbers because it's not an image library. So it doesn't know we're giving it an image. It just thinks we're giving it an array of data, like a matrix. Whereas CV, even though it's stored as a matrix, it's specifically built around images. So it knows that those numbers are representing colors. So because CV is an image library, there are lots of formats of images. For example, I mentioned that we're using 32-bit colors. Well, we could also use 16-bit colors, which would lower the quality of our picture, but would make the file smaller. And we could use four numbers if we wanted to have an alpha channel, but in our case, we don't want an alpha channel, so we're just gonna be using three. So I need to tell it which image format this data is in. And it's important to get this correct because if I told it I only have two colors or that my colors are 16 bit instead of 32, it's gonna misunderstand the data and my Tesseract results are gonna be completely wrong. Finally, we need to get the data from TensorFlow and pass it to the cv.mat function. So I think I'm gonna rename this image variable to tensor because OpenCV really is designed around images, but tensor is really just designed around arbitrary data. So I'm just gonna rename my variable so it's less confusing. And then it's giving a red line here because TypeScript is designed to make sure I don't pass incorrect data to functions because those would be considered bugs usually, but it's misunderstanding 
what this values, what data type format it's in. And the cv.mat function expects it to be in a specific format. So it's giving me an error saying that I'm passing it data the function is not expecting. I can fix that by just type casting it to any. And this isn't actually reformatting the data in any way. It's basically just telling it to ignore whatever error it thinks it found. So if it is an actual error, when I run the code, my code might crash. But if I'm confident I did it correctly, then this is fine to do. So now that I have this, I just need to put into a variable so I can return it for my function. But there's one issue, which is I imported this as 32-bit signed, which is the format TensorFlow wants. But actually the format that I want Computer Vision and Tesseract to use is 8-bit unsigned. So I'm going to convert it right here with the convert to function and I'll pass it the 8-bit unsigned three color parameter because that's the format I want to be using. So it might seem wrong that we're using eight bits for the colors, but it's actually fine. So first of all, it makes sense that we use unsigned because we don't need negative numbers for colors. And second, eight times three is 24. So it's actually 24 bit color. The standard is 32 bit color. And that's because you normally have an alpha channel, which is your last eight bits, but we don't need that in our case. And so by storing it in the smallest form possible, it's going to make CV a little bit faster when it does its math. So essentially we're using eight bits for red an additional eight bits for green and an additional eight bits for blue. And so it's 24 bits in total. So the original format that we were reading it in from with TensorFlow was TensorFlow was thinking of the red as 32 bits by itself and the green as an additional 32 bits. So that's actually way more colors than is normal. And we don't need to support that. And it's going to make our math way slower, but that's just the downside of converting back and forth is this get data and tensor functions don't let you specify that you just want eight bits and 32 bits is standard for just a normal variable. So it's basically converting each individual color to its own variable instead of keeping all three red, green, and blue combined as a single color. Okay. So now that we have our crop image function set up, let's see if we can read this word ash out of this image, but by cropping it with code instead of doing it by hand in paint. One thing I forgot to mention this sync right here on buffer. When I was using Tesseract before, I used the async and await commands. TensorFlow and OpenCV can also be slow, just like Tesseract, depending on what function you're calling. And so they have options where you can choose to call the synchronous version or the asynchronous version. And for simplicity's sake, I'm choosing to use the synchronous version because it allows me to write slightly simpler code, which is easier to explain. Uh, but standard practice is if there is an asynchronous version available, it's better to use that and to use the async await commands because it will allow your program to multitask. And so if you code it that way and you have multiple things that need to execute at the same time, it's possible for it to do that. And also it's going to free up the core on the CPU to be able to do other tasks. But in my case, I'm not gonna worry about that small performance impact because I just prefer the simpler code. So instead of the cropped PNG, I'm gonna go back to the other image I was recognizing. And instead of recognizing the image file name, I wanna pass it an image. So first I need to load this image into a CV matrix variable. So I'll say let image equals CV dot I am read. So that stands for image read. I'll pass it the file name and then it wants flags to tell it which type of format it wants to be read in. So I'm going to say I am read underscore color. So it'll automatically read the header inside of the PNG to figure out if it's 32 bit or 24 bit. And if it has an alpha channel, I don't need to worry about that, but this parameter tells it after it's read all the image, what format it should keep it in because it's common for computer vision techniques to not care about color and to just read it as grayscale. And so rather than requiring you to convert the image after the fact, it lets you pass that in as an initial parameter as it's reading. So now that I've read the image, I want to crop it, but I need to know the coordinates I'm going to crop it at. So let me open my image and scroll down to where the word ash is. And I'm going to select the rectangle 
And I want to code this for other words besides just Ash, because like Alistar is a little bit wider than Ash. So I'm going to draw a rectangle on it that's a little bit big. After I draw that rectangle at the bottom, it says 138 by 22. So that's going to be the width and height I want for my cropping. So I won't specify the X and Y yet, just the width and height. 138 and 22. Now to get the X and Y, I'm just gonna put my mouse cursor on the top left corner of that rectangle. And you'll notice on the bottom left corner of the screen, as I move my mouse, it tells me what X and Y coordinate I'm at. So if I just put it at the top left of that rectangle, it says 1290 by 1042. So let me type that in, 1042. Okay, so now my image is cropped. So I'll put that into a variable and I want to pass it to this recognize function, but I can't because it expects a file name. So I'm going to need to make a new function that takes a file name. And so even though this was cropped in memory after it read the file, I'm going to have to save it to a file. And that's not ideal. It would be better if I could pass the actual memory to Tesseract. And if I really needed to optimize the code, then I could figure out a way to do that, but it's just not the way that this particular node version of Tesseract was designed. So although it'd be better to actually send it the raw memory, it should be fine. I have a solid state hard drive, so it's going to be almost as fast as RAM. And there's a concept in coding called premature optimization, and you want to avoid that. So although I know this is not the most optimal way to code it, it is the easiest way to code it. And your time as a programmer is more valuable sometimes than the speed of the computer. Because having slightly less optimal code might mean it takes an extra half a second to execute something. Well, maybe that's not a big deal. It depends on my users and what they're expecting. And salaries of programmers are pretty expensive. So buying a new computer might be cheaper than paying a programmer to spend 10 hours to recode something a different way. So I'm gonna make a new function instead of this tesseract.recognize and I'll call it OCR image equals function. I'll have to make it async because tesseract is async. And instead of passing in a file name, I'm gonna pass in a computer vision matrix. And instead of having this hard coded config variable, I want that to actually get passed into my function. Tesseract config. And I'll make it a type any because I don't want to define a data type for this just because it'll be more work than it's worth. And then I'm saying equals undefined to give it a default so that I can still make this config here the default. I'll just move it and rename it to default tesseract config. So that way in the situation where I'm trying to read Ash, I know it's only alphabetical so I can pass in that dictionary. But when I'm trying to read in gold, I can pass in a dictionary of just numbers. So that's what this config is going to be used for. And then finally, I'm going to have it return a promise of string, just like the original Tesseract. So I'm going to write an image with CV to a file. So this image parameter will get passed in and then also the file name. So I'll just save it to like ctemp image.png. And I'll put that into a variable so that I can also pass it to Tesseract. So temp image file name equals pass the variable in. And then after I've saved the file, I can just move this Tesseract code up to right here after the file has been created. So I'll pass in the Tesseract config that was supplied to my function. But if it's undefined, I'm going to use the or command to override it from undefined to this default. And instead of the crop image, I'm going to use my file name. And then I'll just return this. So now I have my OCR image function. I can call that inside my test function on the cropped variable. And for now, I'll just leave the config blank so I won't even pass in a second parameter. I could say comma undefined, but if I just leave it off, it'll do the same thing because I gave it a default of equals undefined. So I think that's all the code changes I need to make. I'm expecting that when I run it, I should get the word ash returned. So let's try it out npx ts node index.ts. Okay, I got an exception. So it looks like I did not configure OpenCV all the way. I forgot a step. So in my files, if I look at my package JSON, there are settings I need to put in here to say where OpenCV is installed to on my computer. So I mentioned that you need to go to their website to install it. And I have already installed it, 
but I did not set up the configuration. So on my computer, I installed to the C drive tools, OpenCV build. So in package JSON, and you could copy this from their documentation online, but you need to take the name of the library, OpenCV node.js and make it a new key in your JSON file. And then you need to make three parameters called include dir and lib dir and bin dir. And each of those need to have the correct folder specified. And these all need a prefix called open CV is. So my bin dir is build slash bin and my lib dir is build x64 vc14 lib and my bin is just one level up from there and then into the bin folder and i mentioned before that anytime you use a backslash in a string in javascript and this is a json file so it's similar to javascript um, because backslash is an escape character you need to use it twice to remove the escape character and just make it a normal backslash Oh, I forgot one more parameter. Disable auto build one. So one meaning true. So what happens is the OpenCV node, the first time it runs, it's gonna try to compile the code, but in order for it to compile, it needs additional compiler tools installed. And I don't wanna set that up in particular because a lot of times these packages were designed to be run on Linux, not Windows. And so setting up those compiler tools will be a little bit of extra work to hack it, to make it work with windows. And so I'm just going to take the pre-compiled binaries so that it doesn't need to compile it on the fly. And so that's why I had to download it online. So now that I've got that set up, I expect it to be able to run. So run one more time, fingers crossed. Okay. So it says that it's outputting a promise. So this OCR image, I forgot because I made it an async, um, I'm actually outputting the fact that it's waiting for the response. So that's where I mentioned before, if I'm going to use the promise, I need to call then and make an inner callback function where the result gets sent. But instead of doing that, I just need to add the await command here that I forgot. So run it one more time. Now I have the word ash. Perfect. So now instead of me having to crop it by hand, it's being cropped directly in code and then it's able to read the word. And if you remember, I ran an analysis on this image directly with Tesseract without cropping, and it was not able to find the word ash because all of the other graphics were confusing it. But by cropping just to the spot where the word is, it's able to read it just fine. So now we have a framework that we can read any of the UI pieces that we want. We just need to get a list of all the different coordinates and create a data structure to easily store those coordinates and then just loop over the coordinates to read each one out to the screen. So that'll just be our last little piece. Okay, so first I'm going to set up different dictionaries for Tesseract so that the gold can use just numbers and the champion names can use just letters. So first I'll make a variable that has a list of all of the alphabet characters. And I just typed the uppercase ones so I'll make a separate one for the lowercase ones, but rather than retyping them, I'll just use the two lowercase function. And then I'll make one that's for both. So I'll say alpha equals lower plus upper to concatenate the two. And then I'll make one for just numbers. And I've already pre-typed that here. And then I'll make one for alpha and numbers. So I'll just use these constant variables as default dictionaries, depending on which control I'm using. And then if any control happens to use different characters like dashes or slashes, then I'll just define a custom dictionary for that specific control. So I'll make the default be alphanumeric. Next, I want to define a list of all the controls that are on my screen. So I'm going to make some data types to represent locations on the screen. The question mark signifies that it's nullable, meaning that it can be undefined. So I might have some UI elements where I don't know the location ahead of time. For example, if I'm searching for an item on the screen, I might know the width and height of the item and the image of what it looks like, but I might not necessarily know the location. So that's why I'm making it undefined. And in order to make my data types more reusable, rather than making a type that is the entire UI element, I'm just doing a coordinate by itself. 
as kind of like a base class. And then I'll do a separate class or data type for like the width and height and other parts. So for example, I can say a rectangle has a coordinate of X and Y, but in addition, it has a width and height. And then I can say a UI element is a rectangle, but it also has an image, which is a computer vision matrix and maybe the text that I want to search for within that rectangle. So the image would be if it's an icon for a weapon. And finally, if it needs a custom dictionary for the OCR to recognize. So now that I have my data type set up, I can make a list of controls, which will be the locations on the screen that I want to scrape. So I'm going to define it as a JavaScript dictionary type or a hash table. So the key will be a string and the value will be an UI element. So for example, the player's gold has a specific X location, Y location, width and height. And then the dictionary it will use will just be numeric. So what I'm going to do is open up this image in a paint program. And just like I did before to find the coordinates for Ash, I'll do the same thing for each of the pieces on the screen and I'll copy the coordinates into the code. So I think the pieces that I'm going to want is right here, which is the player's level right here, which is how much experience they have until they gain their next level. Up here at the top it says which round of battle that they're in. And also here at the top, it says how many seconds are left in the current battle. And then down here, it shows how many wins or losses they have in a row. And then of course we have all the character names, everything else that's on the screen. I think I can ignore for now. I will also need to scrape data out of images themselves, which I'll show in a separate video. For example, which items I have available to equip to my characters. So now that I've got the coordinates from the paint program, I'm just going to type them in real quick. Okay. They're all typed. So the gold has these coordinates and we'll use numeric. The experience will use these coordinates. And in addition to numeric, it will have a slash symbol because you'll notice that it's four out of 20 four slash 20 for my current experience. And then the level has these coordinates and will also be numeric. The battle round, which is at the top here, the two dash three, it'll be numeric with a dash. The timer has these coordinates and will be numeric and the streak count will have these coordinates and numeric. So that will work for all the numeric ones. Next, I need to do the ones for the names of the heroes available to purchase in my deck. So I'll type those in real quick. Okay. I've got them all typed in now. So the Y width and height will be the same on all five cards. The only difference is the X will just be a couple hundred pixels shifted to the right for each one. And they'll all use the alpha for the dictionary. So I've got card choice one through five. So now that my coordinates are all typed in, instead of calling this OCR image on the hard coded coordinates that I'm using for cropping, which I was using to read for Ash, instead, I need to loop over my entire controls dictionary and crop to the specific coordinates of that control and then output that to the screen. So to do that, I'm just going to do a for loop that loops over each key in the dictionary. And from each key, I'll pull out the value and then I'll call the same crop and OCR code I was calling before. I'll just put it inside of the for loop. And instead of hard coding the coordinates for cropping, I'll use the element from the dictionary. So it'll use the X value, Y value, the width and the height. So now the image has been cropped and then I'm going to OCR it. But when I OCR it, I also need to send the OCR dictionary. And then I will log the name of the control along with the result from the OCR right here, where I pass in the dictionary to OCR image, I should actually be merging the default object with my new object. A library that I like to use for just general JavaScript utility function is called Lodash. So I'm going to say npm install Lodash. So I'm going to import that from Lodash. And if I were now to type underscore dot, it looks like the typings didn't come in. Let me also install the typings. So if I do npm install at sign types slash Lodash, that should get the type information. And I probably should do the same for node, which is going to have some JavaScript utilities that are specific for making applications outside of the browser part of the node framework. But 
Okay, that's better. Now I have all these different utility functions that I can use. They were available to me even before I installed the types package for Lodash, but the types package gives me autocomplete as well as the parameters that each function needs and documentation. So it's going to be much easier to code with. But all of these different utility functions, I just find incredibly helpful for every project I work on because it kind of adds additional functional concepts to JavaScript. And I really like functional programming. What I can do with this dictionary now is I can say underscore dot merge and I can pass in an empty object and then I can pass in the default config that I want. And what that's going to do is it's going to take this object and essentially clone it into that empty object that I created by copying each value one at a time. That way, calling OCR image multiple times, I don't somehow accidentally mess up my original config setting. And then I'm going to tell it the one property I want to override, which is the Tesseract character whitelist property. And that's where I'm going to pass in the OCR dictionary from this custom element that I'm searching for. So this line got a little bit long, so I think I'll copy that into its own variable. So I'll say let config equals and then pass config in. Okay, I think that will fix the bug. So let's rerun it. MPX TS node index. Okay, I think that looks a lot better. So now the gold is reading at five, XP 4120, level five. Okay, this battle round is still wrong. It should be two dash three and it's saying 23, but the timer looks correct. The streak count looks correct. All of the character names showed up. So this looks great. So as I mentioned before, for examples like the experience, the 4120 where the one should be a slash. And in the case of the battle round, 23 should be two dash three. I'll have to code something specific just to fix those specific ones, but otherwise they should work. And another change I might want to make is right here. I'm passing in the X, Y width and height, but I got those coordinates from a screenshot I took at 1920 by 1080. So I may want to do something like this. If I make a default width of 1920 and a default height of 1080, and then maybe I have like a current width, let's say the user is on. So like a 2k monitor is uh, 2560 by 1440. So if they're happen to be playing on a bigger monitor, these coordinates are going to be wrong because everything's going to be scaled. So what I can do is calculate a, a um, scaling factor. So scale factor width equals, and I would just divide the actual width from the width that all my coordinates were calculated off of my screenshots. And then I can do the same thing for my height and divide the actual height from the default height. And then I can use these scale factors and multiply the X and the width and the Y and the height. So that should translate so that if someone's playing on a different screen size, the coordinates should still work. And one last fix I could do is when I'm specifying the dictionary for my card choices, I'm just saying that I want letters and not numbers, but I'm not saying what specific words I should be expecting. So take for example, Alistar. If his real character name was like A-I-I-S-T-A-R, well, look at the letter L and the letter I, they're quite similar. It's theoretically possible that Tesseract could misread just one letter of that character. So essentially I can make an additional function which finds the closest match to a correct character name and corrects it if it misreads just one letter. So the way I would code something like that is there is an algorithm called Levenstein. So I'm going to do an npm install fast dash Levenstein. And what this algorithm does is it takes two words and it analyzes the number of keystrokes that would be required to convert from one to the other. So in this case, to convert from this to Alistar, I would basically just have to highlight the one incorrect letter and change it from an I to an L. So essentially saying that there's one letter that's incorrect. And if I count the number of letters here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that basically means there was one incorrect out of seven, or I could say six out of seven were correct. So if I pulled up a calculator and said six out of seven, that's an 85% score. So that would be close enough that I would consider them the same. And so I'd be okay to do that spelling correction. So the API for Levenstein is pretty simple to code. I'm just going to do import 
star as Levenstein from fast Levenstein. And then I'm gonna call Levenstein.get and I'll pass it my two words. So I'll do Alice star spelled correctly and then I'll do it spelled incorrectly. And I'm gonna comment out my test code for now so that it doesn't run. And I'll just output to the screen with a console.log what this Levenstein comes up with. MPX TS node index. Okay, so it says the number one, which as I said before, it means that there's one character that's off. So if I divide that by the correct word dot length, then it should give me the 85% that I was mentioning before. Um, okay, so it gave me the opposite, which is 15%. So I would want to just do one minus this because I actually did one out of seven instead of six out of seven. So what I could do next is I could pull up a website called tftactics.gg and this just lists a whole bunch of data about Teamfight Tactics. And I could go into database champions and I could take each champion name. So I've got Aatrox, Alistar, and I could do each one and make an array of champions. And then I could make a function called something like pick closest, which takes text, which is like kind of like the compare text, and then the dictionary, which is an array of strings, and then a threshold, which is a number. And maybe I'll default that to say that it has to be at least 25% correct. And then I could just loop over each champion in the array and call this Levenstein function to compare the text from the dictionary to the text that Tesseract found. Now, this is kind of an imperative style of coding, which is how generally programmers start coding at first but I prefer functional style. I think it's a little bit better because the code is shorter and more reusable. So if I were to code this the functional way, I would instead take my dictionary and call the map function on it. And that's essentially the same as a for loop, but it's going to create a new array that contains the results of calling a function on each value of the array. So because it's a function, the first part of the function is your parameter. So I'm just going to call it X to signify the current value that I'm looping over. And then you use the arrow function for just like an inline anonymous function. It's called the Lambda. You can use the longer syntax of function X curly brace, but I just think the Lambda syntax is a little shorter. I'm, I'm just going to call this similar logic, but I'm not going to do any if statements. I'm just going to run this calculation. Oh, and I forgot this should not say Alistar here. This should be the length of the text I'm comparing. And I think it probably should be like math.max of the compare length and the text length. So essentially if one of them is five characters and the other is seven characters, it's going to use the larger of the two, the seven, and use that as the denominator when determining what percentage you got right. So anyways, I'm just going to take this formula and put it inside of my map function. So normally with the Lambda, you don't need curly braces, but I want to return an object and objects need curly braces. And it gets confused if you have double curly braces. So I, normally you also don't need the return keyword. So if the map was just going to like convert um, everything in the dictionary to the value five, then this essentially just says return five, even though I didn't actually show, use the word return. So here I'm going to have to do a slightly more verbose syntax, uh, but I'll say that the text is x and the threshold match is or like the match percentage is this value and i'll use x which was the input to my map function so it's the value of the current loop i'm in the dictionary that i'm iterating over so i'll use that instead of the text variable that i was using before so that's what the this map function does is it's going to call this formula on every single value in the array okay so that maps it but next i need to handle this if statement. So after the map, I'm going to chain it with a dot filter. And because my line of code is getting too long, I'm just going to hit the enter key to put this filter on the next line below. But I'm going to filter to say that I only want to keep values from this dictionary that are greater than or equal to the threshold. So that's essentially doing what this if statement was doing, except this X is a text and a match percentage. So I need to check the match percentage against the threshold. And then finally, I'm gonna use the underscore dot order by function and pass in this entire result. So 
and, and that's the beauty of functional coding is it's designed so that you can chain things together. So it's much shorter and reusable compared to imperative code with like normal for loops and variables. So I'm going to do an order by, and the reason is to sort it so that I get just the best one. So outside of the filter, I'm going to do a Lambda. So again, I'll use X as my parameter and then I'll say X dot match percentage. So that's going to sort this entire result based on the match percentage. And by default, it's going to be ascending, meaning that the smallest match percentage will be first. But afterwards, I'm just going to want to grab the first one, which is the best, and I'm going to want to return it. So this really should be in order by descending instead of ascending. So I can do that by just timesing this match percentage by negative one. So I'll say that this is my result and I'll return result dot text. So now I can delete this for loop code. So it's kind of up to you whether you prefer the imperative style or the functional style. Functional takes a while to get used to because it looks a lot more complicated in the beginning. But once you get used to it, um, I really like it. So that's essentially how I could create a dictionary of champion names and make sure I get the best one. So the only other two things that I should scrape would be in this unit overlay image. Here, I've clicked on a character and it pops up and it shows who the character is and all their attributes. The reason that might be useful is if I get a free unit from picking up a bonus after killing a monster. And that would be a unit that I didn't choose to purchase from the cards down here. So I could technically use OpenCV to analyze the 3D model to see who this character is, but that's gonna be much more difficult than just reading the text of their name. And it's not too hard for me to just uh, right click on the character to get this pop-up to show so that I can analyze the text. So that's the approach I plan to use. I haven't showed how to code that, but it's gonna be almost identical to the other Tesseract code, just putting in screen coordinates. The only difference is that this pop-up is going to be at a, a place that's anchored to where the 3D model is. So it's not going to have a fixed X and Y coordinate. So I'll need to think of where I clicked and then do an offset from where I clicked. And the final one would be in the battle rounds, it calculates damage while they're fighting. So you can see on the right side here, it shows each of my characters and how much damage they uh, in this case blocked. But if I click these icons down here, there's also how much damage they dealt and how much damage they healed or shielded. And that will be useful for me to figure out which of my characters is the strongest. And I probably won't use that to make a change in my strategy during the current game, but I'll track those statistics and save them into a database so that after I've played a few hundred games, I can use that to analyze statistics on which champions do the best in certain combinations. And so that I can use that for planning for uh, future games and deciding which characters to purchase. Again, that's something that can partially be done with Tesseract just to read the number, but then I'll need to do image scraping with OpenCV to figure out which character it is based on this icon. So I'll show the image scraping in the next video, but the Tesseract portion I've already demonstrated here. So I'm not going to code every single example since they're all very similar, um, but now you should have a general overview of how Tesseract works so you can incorporate it into your projects. So that's everything I wanted to demonstrate. Hopefully you found this video useful. Please let me know what feedback you have on how I could improve my code. And thanks for watching.